Welcome, everybody, live to the Jim Masters Show, Entertainment Lifestyle, Celebrity Talk Show Series. So great to have you with us. Boy, do we have an extraordinary guest and an amazing episode taking you down memory lane as well with some of your favorite shows and movies that you've been telling us about when you heard that Alex Hyde White is joining us here on our show. He's an extraordinary, well-known and celebrated actor, producer, director, voice artist, and so much more. And he is my special guest exclusively here on the Jim Master Show Live Series. Thanks for joining us, everybody. So cool. So great to have you here watching all around the world. We have an international audience. We thank you so much for all the support and love for this series, bringing back the Lost Start of Conversation and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guests who've come through here, JMS Lovety Hall and uh, the Gym Master Show Live. If you ever miss an episode or you join us late, don't fret, don't worry. All of them are archived right here on the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. There's almost a thousand episodes you can binge watch and enjoy, get a cup of coffee and enjoy some of your favorite celebrity guests and so much more. But right now it is Alex who's joining us here not from New York, not from Nashville or Chicago, or you would think Hollywood or LA, right? No, he's in beautiful Florida towards the Pensacola area. And it's uh, kind of a sweet spot to be right about now, wouldn't you say, gang? He's joining us and we thank you for joining us. I see a lot of comments already built up in the JMS Lovely Hall chat room. Gang, if you would like to comment during the show while it's on live, just subscribe to the YouTube channel right now, Jim Masters TV. And guess what? You can comment right now. Say hello to us. Say hello to one another. Share stories and um, yeah, interact with our show. We're very interactive here at the Gym Master Show Live. So let's talk about our extraordinary guest who you may remember as Dr. Reed Richards from Fantastic Four. Yeah, we've got some, we have some really special things we're going to be showing you here that take you back in time a little bit. This, of course, an iconic movie coming from Marvel. And you know, there's a book he wrote as well, Alex Hyde White, My Life in Film and TV. And if you have not picked up your copy, we will definitely tell you how you can. It is something you're going to want to add to your collection. I know many of you have said you have a copy already, uh, but if you don't, we'll let you know how you can get it. You can go to Amazon and places like that. We'll also tell you about his, his website. It is a phenomenal book. Uh, it's really fantastic, fantastic in the volume, and you're going to love this. And again, of course, as I mentioned, how could anybody forget the Fantastic Four? And, uh, you know, it took some time to put this together. There was like three or four attempts to be able to make it happen and bring it to life as a film. Uh, there is that, and yes, Indiana Jones, too. He was in that. Now, he's been in so many things, folks, television, film stage all of it and catch me if you can of course pretty woman yes did you know that mm -hmm. he was in that as well yeah of course biggles a lot of people you guys mentioned that as well he's still doing his thing producing directing doing voice work acting as well uh he was also in Bat battlestar galactica he had a role in there as well and more recently in dama uh, the monster, yes, monster the Jeffrey Dahmer story. And uh, Michael Leonard was in this too. You may recall she was a guest on our show. Of course, she played uh, the mother on the Waltons and we had a wonderful conversation with her. But uh, Alex was in this recently as well. He was also in Nope, which was of course uh, created by Jordan Peele. Take a look at this good looking shot, huh? <laughs> We've got some vintage and classic, this is from Catch Me If You Can, uh, classic shots we're going to show you here and some wonderful exclusive photos that Alex was generous and kind enough to share with us here on the show. This is from Biggles, of course, as well. This with Princess Diana. We're going to talk about this one as we go along. We won't show all of them now, just sprinkling in a few of them here. Mm hmm May bring back a few memories and stir a few memories for you as well. But uh, yeah, it's really exciting to have him here on the show because, again, he's been doing this for a long time and uh, he's an English American actor and uh, brilliant at the craft. He's a beloved, celebrated actor. 
And we're going to talk a little bit about his background, and then we'll have him join on the show. I see a lot of comments uh, coming in live to the Gym Master Show, so we thank you for that. You know, under contract to Universal Pictures at age 18, his first television job was one line, and that line was, leave my mother alone. Spoken to star Jack Klugman, of course, who was on the television series Quincy. And, uh, you know, Quincy, medical examiner, was a fantastic series on NBC. Of course, that followed when Jack was on The Odd Couple. Now, Alex uh, recurred in several episodes and each time as a different character. And he also made numerous appearances in Battlestar Galactica, as we mentioned, later Buck Rogers in the 25th century, which also featured his father, Wilfred. The only time both father and son appeared on screen together was on The Merv Griffin Show in 1980. And a clip from that show is featured in his film, Three Days of Harriet. In 1994, he played the Marvel comic superhero, Reed Richards, a.k.a. Mr. Fantastic, in the motion picture adaptation of Marvel's flagship comic series, The Fantastic Four. The film was low budget and made by certain parties in order to retain the film rights to the property, but uh, never released. Bootleg copies of the film made the rounds and the film has acquired its own following. Now, Alex is uh, regarded by many comic fans, of course, and uh, those who love comics as the best embodiment of the character who has since been played by Ian Grufford and Miles Teller, and also through his production company, TMG, named after his mentor, the Washington attorney, Stephen Martindale, he produced a 2002 independent romantic drama, Pursuit of Happiness, which was really fantastic as well. Folks that were in that, and Beth Gish and uh, Frank Whaley and Adam Baldwin, and also featured Gene Stapleton in a cameo as the advertising agency's owner. And Staples son, uh, Stapleton's son, John, was the director of that as well. Also, uh, he had directed Alex previously in Deep Water and in Murder 101 for Hallmark. I know there's a lot of folks who love the Hallmark channel. He's worked with Steven Spielberg three times. I mentioned Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade and young Henry Jones Sr., catch me if you, can, if you can, and so much more. And he was also a divorce lawyer in this, which is Tintin. Remember that one? Yeah, that's just the short list, folks. We're just going through the short list. There are so many more shows and specials and films that he's been a part of. He's been a part of our lives for quite some time. And he's going to be a part of our life right now, exclusively on the Jim Masters show. And we're so happy to have him here. Alex, welcome to the show. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. Hey, Jim. I didn't, I forgot that I'd worked that much. Thank you very much. That's terrific. I am Ralph Edwards, and this is your life. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How are you in beautiful Pensacola, Florida? Yeah, it's great. There's probably another half an hour left of uh, daylight and the weather's turning and um, steamy summers, but it's a beautiful area. You know, it's a, yeah. it's a small town, but it's a it's a important area. There's a naval base here and it's easy to get around. After 40 years in Hollywood, I kind of feel like, you know, um, I was in the army a bit in uh, showbiz. And yeah. uh, even though I worked around the world, L.A. just kept get getting bigger and bigger. And it just um, it's nice. To, it's nice to have a different perspective. Absolutely. Are you a water person? Do you like being near the ocean? You know, I've lived so much near the ocean. The, I'll tell you, the beach here, the Gulf of Mexico, is preferable to the Pacific Ocean, which is yes. cold and windy. Yes. Um, you know, I'm a tennis player, so I, I've, yeah, I've discovered right. clay. I've discovered clay tennis courts here. Oh yes. So I guess I'm. You know, I'm probably a landlubber. Diehard tennis fan. I play tennis as well. Diehards know that the clay is really one of the best ways to play. Of course, pickleball is all the rage. Do you play that too? No, I've heard of it, but no. no yeah. I'm going to keep at the long game as long as I can. <laughs> I have a friend who's actually a tennis pro and teaches teaches kids, and he says the same thing. I said, hey, aren't you gonna, you've done ping pong. You're into tennis. Seems like it's almost combining those two and merging it into pickleball. Are you going to get into pickleball? He goes, 
No, <laughs> I'm tennis. I'm it's tennis very popular. Very popular. I like I like to keep fit, and tennis is yeah. tennis is my Jones. So early on for you, what were some of the things that pointed you in the direction, Alex, of wanting to go into acting, to the world of entertainment, to taking that plunge? The the family background, the familiar background, was it very encouraging in that direction? You know, I grew up in the theater. And a couple of things happen when you do that. You basically learn to get along with almost everybody, you know, because the theater, like the circus, it attracts people who quite often don't really fit anywhere else. And um, and I was a very precocious, young, smart, young kid. You know, my dad was considerably older. He was 55 when I was born. And he's a smart guy and, uh, you know, wonderful, instinctive actor. He didn't have much sort of um, life skills. His, his, his world was very much uh, as an actor, as an entertainer, and he was extremely good at it. Uh, and so I was sort of um, imbued with a, du a duality. I, I enjoyed that atmosphere, but I also wanted to have a foot in the real world. And fortunately, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, Southern Cal, uh, a little house in Palm Springs, right when television and uh, the auteur American films were coming. And so there was so much inspiration. And um, then uh, that combined with um, the fact that I got out of high school at age 16. And this is kind of how I started my book. I kind of like left home at age 16 and I've been trying to return ever since, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, you know, you grew up fast, you grew up um, uh, uh, kind of at your wits, you know? And um, I didn't like sales. I did a bit of uh, real estate in the desert when I was 17. I worked in restaurants. I was a good driver. So I had those life skills and I enjoyed the problem solving aspect of, of auditioning as a, as a young actor. And then, of course, all of that doesn't mean anything if you don't get work. Mm. And it's fine to have an entree, because I did. Uh, I, I had a, 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 an agent who, who was interested in me because he knew me since I was a kid. So those qualities that I think sort of drove me to discover the real world at a young age ended up equipping me for make or break kind of uh, atmosphere of uh, of Hollywood, you know, mm -hmm. and I uh, mm -hmm. got I got lucky enough in the first few years. Then then, of course, the rest of it is just how long can I delude myself to think <laughs> that uh, that that uh, that I uh, and I've never really found anything else to do. But having said that, though, yeah, the uh, one step in the real world was my producerial instincts. And, you know, I I love putting things together. And these, this day and age, most actors, you know, either own content or create content or produce. And uh, when I was starting, it wasn't that many. And so uh, I'm, I'm kind of happy with the, with the dual nature. And then, of course, that's allowed me to, I think, be a better actor because yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily define me as much. I like to bring, you know, a, a whole life experience to it. Back in uh, 78, you signed, as I mentioned, with Universal Pictures as one of the last contract players yeah. in Hollywood with a quite a group, Lindsay Wagner and Andrew Stevens, Sharon Gless and others. Tell us about that opportunity. What well, that yes. was like. You know, I've recently been in touch with Jamie Lee Curtis, a wonderful Oscar winner now, uh, because she was part of that group. Um, and as as Merlin is asking on your on your chat list here, you know, Punch is my middle name. And um, I grew up in Palm Springs High and people say, hey, there's Punch. Wasn't and your when dad, did your dad give you that? Yeah, yes, he did. You know, he was a, he was a funny, dad was a funny guy. Yeah. Um, he, he uh, Punch meant something to him. He couldn't quite remember. And then his older sister reminded him he had a dog named Punch. He said, oh, good. I quite like the cigar and, you know, all this nonsense. So I was Punch and that's fine. But that was a time when there weren't really any any nicknames. Of course, a few years later, there was Axel and Madonna and Sting and all that bit. So the story really that that, that one of your uh, uh, admirers here, uh, Merlin's asking, where did Punch come from? Um, you know, it came with a bit of uh, family intent. He, he thought that it would be lucky for me. 
And I auditioned for Universal for the uh, people who ran the new contract program because they were hiring boys to fly jets in space for Galactica. And uh, I did a scene from one of my dad's summer stock plays that we toured up there in your neck of the woods, um, up in Guilford and Danbury, Connecticut. So I knew all those towns from when I was a teenager. And at the end of the uh, scene, when my dad, of course, dropped the first cue just to see if I was uh, awake, and I unfortunately was, the end of it, Monique said, oh, Punch, I think we can find a job for you, but I don't know what we can do about your dad. So that was a lovely way to start. <laughs> and then the second thing she said is Punch. No, no, no. Do you have another name? And I go, Alexander. And she goes, oh, too many letters. And I go, tell me about it. So she said, Alex Hyde White. You're not a comic actor. I said, okay. And that was how I started. But to this, uh, actually, until the union sort of changed its database a few years ago my sag card said punch hide white mm. and so now as an audiobook uh for my audiobook company i'm punch audio and so i get to um i get to finally be myself audiobooks are terrific aren't they to have an opportunity to do that and take on the characters and do the narration oh, it's one of it's 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 pure storytelling i mean yes it's a, it's a throwback to you know, Elizabethan times, uh, uh, actor managers being able, I mean, uh, we cast a lot of multi-narrator. It's, it's lovely. I love the storytelling aspect. And of course, I um, enjoy not having to have a camera. I mean, in 40 year career, I produced two movies. In the last 12 years, I produced probably, we produced about 500 audio books. So I'll stick with this. Which is absolutely amazing. Tell us about your dad and how much of an inspiration he w was early on for you with his wit and wisdom. <laughs> well, you know, he was an easy person to admire because he had a wonderful technique. But personally, like a lot of truly talented people, he was difficult. And, you know, I, I suppose I was too in my sort of prepubescent way. And um, we had a, a, a very strong connection that sometimes alienated others in, in, in our family. And so I felt grateful that I'd been thrust into his world. Um, but I also felt near the, you know, because he lived to be almost 88 the last few years, I felt I was, I felt happy to be, I suppose, his caretaker so much or to, or to look after him, you know, it's awfully hard to separate the actor that he was from the man he was. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a bittersweet nature to it as well. Um, and, uh, but you see, he was so well liked by extremely talented people, none more so than Peter Sellers, yeah. who recognized a kinship. And Peter was a tremendous depressive of a, of a, of, of, a, of a man. It was a wonderful, and you know, sometimes I, I sort of grew up thinking that it was a bit of a curse being truly talented, you know, because of what you have, what you cannot experience sort of as a human, you therefore try to seek it out in character. And I think Daniel Day-Lewis has been very much like that in a modern sense. Um, the the uh, uh, Steve McQueen, they said, was when he was working, he would put himself through such torment. And um, I was always wary of that. So I suppose what I really learned from my dad was to respect and to honor the joy, but also beware of the, you know, of the, uh, of the, of the dark side, I suppose. Would you say that over the years you've been hard on yourself, striving for excellence and or perfection in the work that you do and in the craft? Sometimes when there's a lot of lines, you know, like if I was on a soap opera playing a general hospital. General a hospital, that's yeah, right. Yeah, there's a family there, um, Quartermains. The Quartermains. And every couple of years, they need to have their English lawyer <laughs> back to sort something out, right? And... Uh, of course, you go to work for two days, three days on the show, and they give you like six pages of it's line. It's unbelievable, you know, yeah. The first part, you see, you can't quite do it that way. And, and you know, 
it's you got to learn those darn lines and it's wonderful um but that's the that's the hard part but i think that as i've gotten older it's gotten easier in a sense that rather like the and i wasn't like this as a younger actor and i admired young actors who were like this like sean penn for for instance or or timothy hutton or um you know young colin firth or even richard gear that i found out in 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 pretty woman when i was 30 years old they bring something right away there is an essence and the greeks would call it charisma you know and i think the uh, the result of me growing up sort of fast and somewhat wild influenced by american television in the 70s and 80s it all looked so easy starsky and hutch clint eastwood movies you know star wars my gosh it was all so effortless and then once you once you're there once you're in there you realize that actually you know it takes effort to appear effortless yes absolutely you know? i say that all the time it really really does you need you need to do your homework yes and the one thing i learned from daniel because i knew him a bit when we were starting out was you know he was very worried that he wasn't going to remember his lines and so mm. he would just learn them and learn them and learn them and i adopted that attitude i think so I'm more of an outside in actor occasionally when i'm asked i just go you know especially now with audio uh, as a as a key driver of my storytelling is whatever the lines are you've written the script and it's up to me to make sense of it and yes we can have a dialogue i'm not going to come in there and you know and 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 do it my own way i'm going to do it your way and then be able to forget it and what 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 uh, appears as a result of a of a trusting collaboration which is what make, makes uh, jordan peel what a, a, such a wonderful director um but learn them in the following way how should they sound okay you know um get out of my way uh you you know um dear sir that could be said a few ways okay you know but how does it serve the purpose of the moment of the scene all right get out of my way dear sir or get out of my way dear sir you know whatever whatever how, it's in there learn it how does it sound how should it look and then work it until you can do it no other way and then peter coyote used to say break the spine of it mm -hmm. you know but yeah. At the end of the day, Jim, it's not a it's a demanding profession, but that doesn't mean that every job is going to be demanding, all right? If you're a really good mountain climber and you can breathe air at 6000 feet, you shouldn't be huffing and puffing so much when you're at 3000 feet doing right. you know an episode of Quincy or um <laughs> the mentalist like you showed me a picture with me and Simon Baker there, you know. Yeah. And then, of course, I've had such joy to be on shows mm. that were just simply, in my instance, the best shows around at the time. It started on my 25th birthday when I was did a couple episodes of Hill Street Blues. You know, I mean, that what was, a birthday gift that is. Yeah, huh? that was just mm. absolutely yeah. wonderful. And then later yeah. on, being on um, shows like The Unit when it was popular, New Heart, of course, uh, it's it's incredible. You know, I'm. What was it like working with Bob Newhart? such a class act yeah i mean you know it's almost uh well he's hollywood he's sort of comedic royalty in a way yeah, you know yeah um very accepting you sort of knew that you could get fired any moment until it was thursday and then the, the show <laughs> taped on friday so you know you had to do your thing but those parts that they gave me they were just wonderful and they were sort of the kind of character that 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 i grew up around in the theater and Merv Griffin was in the first episode a high society was called where Julia Duffy travels down to uh New York to uh, to this charity you know I'm going to a charity dinner and Peter Scolari can't go for some reason because he's you know hanging sheaves at the <laughs> at the inn and she meets Scooter Drake and that was I'm Scooter Drake you know I have more money than sense but I have a lot of sense you right. know that kind of character is the only way I felt I could possibly play it and Merv was a guest at the party doing a cameo. And uh, my dad and I had been on, uh, Merv really liked my dad. Yeah. And he did, you know, whenever somebody would fall out, we li he lived up in Studio City. And uh, uh, 
his uh, stage manager would call at three o'clock, Wilfred, can you come in? He said, oh my God, who am I replacing? And, you know, it doesn't matter. So he'd go in. So he had me on with him. And then the next year, or a couple of years later, we're, 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 uh, we're working together, me and Murph. Murph Griffin, he owned half of Hollywood. I mean, yeah. and yeah. he said to me, tell your father, you were a very good father. And so, you know, <laughs> I did. I didn't want to be a fop. I wanted to be a leading man, but I was funny in that. That was great. And that, of course, led to Pretty Woman, didn't it? Yes. Yes, it did. It did, because they gave me another episode. Uh, two, three months later, my agent called and said, they want you to do another uh, episode of Newhart. They're sending the script over. And it was wonderful. This is the old days where the scripts were actually printed en masse. Yes. And delivered by the union driver. And done. knock, knock, here's the script to Newhart. I opened the script and it's a chapter in the book um it's called the um 1.5 million dollar man and i open it up and bob's saying you know i'm thinking about selling the inn and then i'm in walk scooter drake ah uh, yes i think i'd like to buy the inn and it was this whole episode and i was what i was 29 years old i'd been an actor for 10 years and this was the last season of newhart in his third series. I mean, he was as big as Jackie Gleason was at, uh, at his height. And they gave me this episode simply because I was a rather good fop in the other one, you know? <laughs> and, um, and it was wonderful. And Bob said to me, you know, Alex, I was thinking about actually, you know, selling you the inn. But then I thought, mm, no, I don't think my fans, the Newhart fans would, would, would like to think of me as rich. To which, of course, I re would reply, he says, no, and me and me either so you know happy to do the two episodes but the casting people at disney were trying to cast this difficult part of a not a fop but sort of a romantic rival the rival to richard gear and pretty woman yeah. and like i say i was 29 i was 30 i was a decent looking fella and i could be funny in a classy way and what gary marshall was all about class and humor you know and it was it was just a perfect match. How and, incredible, uh, too. I mean, yeah. and the exposure just continues to branch out from there. I mean, everything you're naming these are all iconic well, movies, woman, television I mean, series. That, you know, it's Richard Gere at his sort of comeback finest, and then Julia Roberts just becoming Julia Roberts right in front of your eyes. I mean, right the soundtrack, it was just an extraordinarily. Um, rare confluence it was good casting i mean you know what was it like think, working with jack klugman ah he was great he moved his hands a lot you know? yeah <laughs> my dad didn't like that my dad was a british actor and he always said put your hands by your side and jack, jack klugman he's like, now listen i'm gonna do you this but i did uh, we had the same agent dear old uh, agent named abby greshler who put lewis and martin together in the in the 50s i think and he was my dad's agent and Abby uh, would call me and say, uh, okay, Punch, listen, you've got this audition over here. And listen, can you talk to your dad? Because he's being difficult on the associates. So, you know, I, I serve dual purpose for dear old Abby. But um, <laughs> every, 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 he, he had Jack Klugman at, uh, over at Universal. So, you know, I got three or four episodes of Quincy during my contract years. And even the year that it was over, uh, when the actor strike of 1980 mm -hmm. gave Universal a good excuse to pull the plug. But that was fine. It was two years. But Jack was great. There was one episode that I remember doing as a, a young doctor, I think. And I had to be very compassionate in telling a story about an infant, a sudden infant death syndrome. And, you know, afterwards, he just stayed with, uh, after, the, after my, my close-up, the scene was over. He was just so impressed. He was just so nice, he said, Alex. That was very good. You're going to do all right, that kind of thing, you know. And I didn't move my hands a lot, so I think my dad was probably pretty pleased too. But it was rare to have a calm scene, a, a sort of a solemn scene uh, as a young actor uh, in a show like that. And so that was an early, that put a lot of fuel in my tank, remembering that story, you know. Mm. Your mother, Ethel, a stage manager in England. You were born in England, of course. Your father, the British actor. How much of an influence and inspiration was your mother? Well, you know, she was the left brain of the operation, a lot younger. And, you know, um, 
that it, that all lasted. She was a she was very good at sort of practicalities and, and rehearsals. So it was a really a really good blend because I had the sort of creative um, sauce of brilliance from dad. And then the uh, okay, now just got to do it a little quicker kind of thing from mom, and that that uh, that lasted well. But it but it ultimately um, ended up being a good blend, I think, for me. Um, she was a little harder to please for some reason. I think, in some ways, my mother, God rest her, um, lamented the fact that that she went into the stage management side. She would have probably preferred uh, uh, staying as an actress. But, you know, like I say, you've got to, you know, you've got to get work pretty early on. And so um, there was an element of sometimes it was never really good enough, you know. <laughs> mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be it it could be tough and you're hard on yourself. And yeah, you know, sometimes you grow up or you're, you're, you're in a you're in a situation where you want to please people. And then other times you got to say to yourself, you know, I got to stop that because um, I had to learn that too. Yes. You know, it's, yeah. it, that can yeah. be takes time. You know, yeah. So yeah. I'm trying to be, um, I'm trying to be tactful here. Yeah. Uh, but, you got to create boundaries. Know, my dad, my dad was very mercurial, hard to live with <laughs> around the time when I was 13, 14, my mom had had enough. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's <just> like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> But the typical British way, we uh, they stayed married even though they weren't, and it's, it's a, the British happy family. Stiff so, upper lip, yes. yes you know, don't, don't tell the neighbors. Yes, yeah. uh, we have some relatives in the New England area that are of similar uh, thinking, and just in terms. It's like of you, just, what, you know, what are you trying to hang on to? What are you? What are you? What, what are you trying to protect? And then you know, uh, it's it's. I think you know these days now. I I I I would expect that the, your audience and certainly you, you know, class wins out kind of thing. You know, uh, there's no situation that you cannot gracefully get through, even if this, even if it's a disagreement or it ends or it ends badly. You know, and to see such immediate vitriol, this immediate judgment on almost all things these days, it's becoming such a trope. And I hope we're past it, but we need to understand, and this is where entertainment comes in. Yes. We need to understand the age old bond that we have with each other is we have to enjoy, we have to enjoy being with other people. You know, that is our purpose. And if we don't do that, then there's something wrong with us. Yeah. And it, uh, it, uh, sometimes it takes people a long time. Sometimes people never, Never, never achieve that. So, you know, um, there was a there was a lot of fuel uh, uh, in in my developmental years. But you know, like I said, I've been I left home when I was sixteen. I got into Georgetown University. I was a smart kid, but I wasn't socially or uh, emotionally emotional intelligence. They talk about is is the main thing. I couldn't stay. I got terribly homesick. Not for being in my home, but. Southern California, this myth and all that bit. And so I lasted. Uh, so I, 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 I just say about Georgetown, it was such a good school that it learned everything I needed to know in one year. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that's when uh, within a couple of years, I became an actor. Yeah. I think if I'd stayed at Georgetown and got into the School of Foreign Service and probably been drafted into the CIA, I probably would have been beheaded by 1989. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll take this. Mm, absolutely. And this too, you took oh, it. Oh no, I wish that was, that was a good looking one. I was in the original with Richard. You're in the <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's not that is that, is that no Lauren Green. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like being in Battle Star Galactic or just even being a part of that? Oh, it was franchise. great. You know, it I was mean. it was great, but it was over so quick. It it um, yeah. It's a yeah. great example of like, you know, all hat, no cattle. It was it it it, it didn't have the production it had the um the look but it didn't have the storytelling uh craft necessary to pull it off it was a tall order they were expecting star wars for tv and um they lost faith in it very quickly um but lou wasserman who ran universal at the time was no fool when he was reminded 
that they actually owned a little known and well-remembered property called Buck Rogers. That's right. He said, okay, go to stage 28, turn the sets upside down, put some paint on them and call it Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Only this time, try to make it funny. <laughs> and, you know, they did. So. Did you enjoy being a part of that? Yeah. You know, yeah. that was dad's thing. You know, yeah. uh, again, they sort of had me around a bit to, uh, to, uh, we were never in the same episode together, funnily enough. But, you know, Dennis Haysbert, the wonderful actor who I worked later with on the unit, he was starting out at the same time. And so, like, I'd be sitting here on the bridge saying, sir, Vector 3, we're coming in close or whatever. And then then Dennis, if they move the camera over to Dennis saying, sir, did you hear, you know, whatever. We were both spits and coughs, they call it. And, um, yeah, John Manley was a showrunner. He, he created Gunsmoke. So, you know, to have to have a foot in that sort of old traditional uh, uh, television. And, you know, these guys, like Newhart, these guys were masters. They're no drama. They didn't, they didn't, that just, they looked at it as a job, as a craft. And it, it and it came down to the script. It always does, which, you yeah. know, which, which made Jordan's movie Nope, which was a wonderful, wonderful script. Um, it, it, it was one, lovely to be in that, you know? Yeah. I always say, you know, it, it's, it's really terrific when you have one of the masters in your life, <laughs> or you are one of the masters. <laughs> it just it just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> I can't tell you, Alex, how many people when I talk to customer service, they're like, "How do you spell masters?" Yeah. I said, "How do you spell masters?" Yeah. Um, have you have you heard of the golf tournament or yeah, the college I degree? Oh, masters! And then the new one. That's years ago. The new one now is I'll say. Jim Masters. Oh, is that with one M or two? Yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> Madonna. Right. M U D. Madonna. Mud, oh. Right. Exactly. Jen, Jen, don't go away. Gil Gerard was great. Gil Gerard right. had a um, had a lightness to him. Yeah. That um, that was very endearing. Yeah. And with with unlike Galactica, they cast around. Gill with real characters with uh, Tom Christopher as like Hawkman. And then there was a little robot. And then of course my dad who acted as if he was inventing his lines. And then, and of course the Aaron Gray as his master. So they really made Gill the center of the show. And that made the difference. Um, we had a German shepherd named Starbuck Apollo. Did you Merlin? Oh, how lovely. Yeah. I had a German shepherd. That's I just think it's amazing. You can yeah. see what those comments say well, I went on from that far it. away without spectacles. Uh, <laughs> You've yeah. got a good pair of eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Most people lean in. Well, now, what did they say? Poor um, Jen. How do you sleep at night? She's English, Irish, Scottish, and Italian. I'm a handful. <laughs> and, and I bet she's got a Jameson in her left hand. <laughs> Usually yes. she does. Well, I'll go back to my tea. They, yes, have that tea. And then Marvel comes a call. Yeah. Well, that's Tell when us, it started to get serious for me. This yeah. is, yeah, this is, and, and a lot of people, of course, you know, I like to do a well-rounded thing. You're, you're an iconic and extraordinary artist in many different ways. And it's, I was very excited to have you here on the show, but a lot of people do. This is one of the big ones that they, they pick out. Uh, how did this happen? How did this come your way? And what was this experience like? Yeah. Well, and it took time to put it together, right? Did several yeah, attempts no, to no, get no. It. it. You know, it's it's still not over. I mean, the story right. the story of it just keeps getting uh, more um, unbelievable in, yeah. in, in a sense. Um, I've been uh, ten years, and then this. Uh, sometimes we we talk about the secret to success. You know, uh, perhaps it's um, like your uh, like you were telling me earlier. Your friend says a, a good moisturizer. Yes. Um, Right. Uh, Merv Griffin asked Gene Hackman, Gene, what's the secret to success when he started to become Gene Hackman? He said, Gene's answer was the, the second 10 years. Okay. So it's interesting. Sometimes it's the second 20 years. Yeah. Right. And so I've been in 10 years. I started um, uh, 79 to 81. The contract was over. Then I went to New York, did a play, did a bounced around things and things. And then 89 was um, the New Heart Pretty Woman bit. So yes. that sort of closed the first act. Uh, yes. And when it came time to formulate my stories for the book, I separated it into seasons. 
And then it's like my apprenticeship was over. I was, I was um, a, certainly a Padawan, if not a Jedi, not yet, not yet a Jedi. Right. But, but Pretty Woman had come. Uh, I'd done a, uh, a a couple of TV movies. Ted Turner um, uh, and, and the great um, Delbert Mann, Oscar director from Marty, back in the early late fifties, early sixties, a, a Ernest Borgnine film hired me to play a Civil War captain in a thing called Ironclads, which mm -hmm. you know, was a pot boiler. It wasn't a very good script, but it was me and and uh, Virginia Madsen in. Um, and so I was I was getting good experience carrying roles, you know, and uh, Roger Corman had this wonderful sort of repertory company of a studio down in the old Venice lumberyard. And a lot of people said, oh, it's a Roger Corman film. And OK, if you're getting John Carpenter films or, you know, uh, 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 then fine. But if you're not and you're doing a Roger Corman film, you realize so were a lot of other actors, uh, uh, not so much Jack Nicholson, maybe in the 60s. And, John Landis and all these people, but Roger didn't quite have that cachet still, but you were still at an opportunity to carry a film. And I'd done a little film called Time Trackers uh, like a year before. And they and all of a sudden my manager called and, Mar and at the time, this fellow named Mark Malice, he was with three other people. Mark had been the casting director at Universal who put me through the, uh, the, uh, the, the steps necessary to get my contract. And he called up and he said, Punch, they're um, casting the Fantastic Four over at Corman, and they want to see you. I said, OK. And we had a look at it. And it was pretty clear what it was. Special effects, stretching, and all this bit. And you know, OK, how are they going to do that? But I went in. And funnily enough, it was just one of those events where Sometimes you walk into the room and the first impression gets you, mm -hmm. gets you what you're look what they're looking for, and you kind of know it and you feel it, and then providing you then go back to what we were talking earlier, you've been prepared. Now all you got to do is play the scene, and that's when thinking of Harrison Ford comes in handy. You know, just just do it which can be the hardest thing for an insecure actor to do. So conversely, if it's done at that sort of style that works, then, then they, they believe in you. They are confident that you are confident that you can play this part in their film, which, as we were soon to find out, is a whole house of cards that's much more important to them than casting this lead role. This was going to be either a sneaky little film that managed to get a nice release or it was going to be sold at the last minute so that the German company who owned it retains the rights, which ended up happening. But because it was Roger, he wanted, he said, you know, I think I'm going to make this film mm. just in case we release it. So mm -hmm. he wanted it to be good. And one of my dearest friends from the film business, which you know, is a really short list. You don't make a lot of really good friends unless, you know, you're their tennis pro or something, you know. <laughs> as, a, as a good actor with a good director or another good actor, you, you know, your friendships are limited. And I, you know, there's there's some sort of calculus there. But w one of them is a, is a, is a wonderful uh, New Orleans native who I see occasionally. Oli Sasson is his name. He was a, an acclaimed music video director when, when those were just starting out in, in the mid to late 80s. And he was, he was entrusted by Roger to direct this film. And I just saw him recently. And to this day, there is this sort of bond that he knew that his cast was going to be looked after. Because Reed Richards, of course, is a character who uh, he has to stretch to make sure he looks after everybody, doesn't he? That's his psychological gesture is here let let me let me look after you and the casting of the film was wonderful we had jay underwood who who was uh, was an experienced uh, young actor as johnny storm playing a part that you know it's easy for jay to play just you know come on come on reed let's go get him now you know uh, okay and then the lovely uh, rebecca staub as the shy susan storm 
and we had a 101st Airborne paratrooper named Michael Bailey Smith who played uh, football at uh, Eastern Michigan University. He was 6'4", and was heartbroken when when they uh, when they showed him the uh, the thing suit to have to play Ben Grimm. He was Ben Grimm, but the thing, of course, it was beautiful casting because he's Michael's huge, but as the thing. He's condensed, and so we yeah. had a wonderful actor named Carl uh, Trafalo play uh, play him. But Michael, to this day, and I'm going to see him. He's getting married in April. To this day, he goes, "Oh, I wish I could have played the part of, in the mm. suit." You know? And what a wonderful group of misfits! So you know, that's the story that people like to talk about. And when they pepper it with lovely, you know, thank you, but it's impossible to leave comments like, you know, you're the best Reed Richards there ever was. And I have to say two things is number one, you've seen the film and yeah, those other films were pretty bad. So, okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. You know, it's Why so that, you... in terms of my development, that yeah. was like the beginning of, that was a big... of, of when it, of, of when it really started to mean something to me. It's also not too shabby to be Mr. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, it all that's... depends who you tell. That's uh, why do you think there's such a cult following for it? Like I mentioned, there were the bootlegs and all this other stuff. What what is it that still keeps it alive? Is it well, look, is it, it the uh, Marvel it, connection? It you hidden. know, from, it was hidden. Yeah. It was hidden for so many years. Yes, and then uh, uh, and then occasionally it'd be a story about the movie that was never supposed to be made, and the very same people who were championing it at the beginning when they didn't know any better, we're now sort of saying, oh, no, I was never on the set and, uh, <laughs> you know, and all that bit. And again, that doesn't really didn't really mean anything until Fox and I guess Disney's taken over now attempted to make these hundred million dollar and hundred and fifty million dollar versions of the Fantastic Four. And, you know, when you it's awfully hard to have four lead roles. OK, mm. so you really can't. And perhaps that's a similar situation with the Buck Rogers and Galactica. Galactica was this show that was going to be wagon train in space, okay? And Buck Rogers was, you know, Gil Gerard's really darn good as this character, just like Simon Baker in The Mentalist, you know? And when you have an anchor, then you can do a lot more. So it's a very hard creative nut to crack. Yeah. How do you tell the story of the Fantastic Four? And you know what? At this point, it's been told. Yeah. It's been told in comics. It's been told in cartoons. It's been told in, in four movies where the worst of them all is now the best. So come on. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe now there's a nice little independent opportunity here. Let's tell the story of the story of the Fantastic Four. The story of the story. The original like film, the little yeah. film that uh, that that couldn't, like The Room, you know, how this yeah. little thing came together. And in this day and age, what with streaming and with so many, um, so many interesting sort of stories to make a docudrama, to make a story about what happened to this. And uh, I wrote about it in my book, um, in the volume. Uh, uh, there's a couple of chapters dedicated to Fantastic Four. And, um, you know, I've often thought, that, that that there that there is a story worth telling here um, in a in a definitive sense, and so you know it would be nice to get the chance to do it. So many others too, of course. Uh, everybody talks about Biggles. Um, how did this come along? Uh, well, that was a, that's just a big break. I mean, that was yeah. that I was in England. You know, I'd been born in London, and so in the uh, when was that? That was mid eighties. I went back, I, you know, after my contract days, I did something in New York then, and I went to England and um, uh, there was, uh, I could play American parts. You see, I was American and I'd done some good stuff. And I, so I did a mini series called the first Olympics in 83 with me and David Caruso and Hunt Block and Jason That's Connery right. recreating right. the Athens games. And it was wonderful. And then I went back a couple of years later. I was a good, uh, I had a good agent at the William Morris agency. And uh, this film of Biggles was coming up. And of course, Biggles was a World War I sort of uh, caricature of the Sopwith Camel stiff upper lip yeah. pilot. And it, a series of books had nothing to do with a modern day American. Um, and, but in the film, they, and I later found out a bit to my chagrin that, you know, they'd sort of gotten downwind of um, 
the uh, what was the film Back to the Future? Oh yes, Michael J. Fox. Yep. And so they took this American, this this American wise guy, and dropped him into World War One, and it ruined the kind of chemistry of Biggles. But it was a wonderful romp, and um, it was Peter Cushing's last film, and I had these wonderful scenes with Peter. And Neil Dixon is an exception. He is. He has remained a, a very close friend through the years, and Neil is the was Biggles, and um, so you know that was a lead role. It was a lead role in 1985 in in London in a nice action adventure film. Uh, uh, I think it was my 24th birthday. I I hung out of a helicopter mm. doing roundabouts, uh, Tower Bridge, and there's How some cool great pictures. That. There's some great pictures in the book, and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was great experience. Amazing. Uh, it, it, uh, and again, I was able once, but I knew then after that, that I wasn't, I didn't want to stay in England. You know, I mean, I wasn't that kind of classical actor like Ken Branagh was getting started. And, you know, and of course that my father being a well-known British actor who had left to go to America, I kind of felt that there was baggage there that I was going to have to almost in a never live up to in a way. So I committed to, um, to to living in Hollywood, and I raised my boys there, and mm -hmm. went through some lean times. But um, no uh, chance of being stereotyped necessarily as just the British actor, which is great. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I can play British parts easily, yeah. which yeah. I get in America. And at that stage, I was I could play American parts uh, pretty uh, pretty easily in England. And then. And of course, sometimes it comes back with a little with a little laugh when Jordan Peele had hired me to play this English uh, production manager of the commercial shoot where Daniel, the hero, gets um, fired from because of the horse doesn't behave in the beginning of Nope. And, you know, it's an English part, very, very, very much. And look, it's all right. You know, it's not going to work out, but there'll be other jobs. You know, I'll really miss your dad and uh, be good to your sister. Now, go on, run on, run along. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm talking to Jordan and he goes, oh, you're not English. And I go, Jordan, we're going to be fine. It's all right. Don't worry. You know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Jordan Peele was wonderful. That was a lovely, uh, lovely experience. And that's the kind of part sometimes I get in big films. Sort of like the hero goes on his journey and the last person he sees, like with Daniel in Nope or Leonardo in Catch Me If You Can, I was the divorce lawyer who's putting him in this emotional vice of, Choosing to just, just just write a name on the thing, as Christopher Walken says. Choosing between, I want you to choose between your mother or your father. And then the next thing you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is running away to his life. Like I ran away to mine. And uh, it's great to play these. You see, because I know what these parts are. When they, when they come up, you're giving the hero the motivation to go and tell the rest of the story. Which means you're not going to be in another scene in the movie, but you know that's that's what they hired you for. And when Steven Spielberg hires me to do that, you can catch me if you can, or Jordan Peele in Nope, then that's a gift. Mm -hmm. That's a picture you're showing from. Mm -hmm. um, that's the Mentalist. That's the wonderful Simon Baker, who um, such a great shot. Yeah, that was such a great to, series. He's a throwback to what CBS did so well for so yeah. long. Yes, these alpha male shows with either you know with the and then of course nbc did it with james garner and rockford files and uh his name escapes this was a terrific series the mentalist on cbs but um the star of the equalizer the original Edward woodward yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah another that was a great yeah he was my brother-in-law for about seven eight years yeah yeah. And then they did a remake. I think later, a few years back, uh, they did the another. Films, uh, the Denzel Washington films are good. I just saw the third one. It takes place in Italy. It's not quite as 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 good. It's a bit it's a bit rough. But and Queen yeah. Latifah has now. You no, know, Equalizer is, is uh, yes. Edward uh, it was in his mid fifties, and I I, I was in England when he was going through uh, getting that um, a job. So yeah, it's um, it's a one wonderful stories that I was able to. Um, recollect in a funny sort of way for one last time. And I put them in the book. And so I feel um, unburdened now by the past. It's, it's, it's extraordinary what did, um, writing ever, one's memoirs can do. Did you ever get a chance to come across some of the other wonderful uh, 
British actors and actresses, so many of them over the years, like well, an Juliet, Andrew, Juliet Mills is a great Juliet friend. Mills. I, I knew her as when she was a young actress who- The Nanny and the Professor. Great, yes. Um, yeah. Stephanie Powers is, is, a, is an American, but she's she's a very classy gal. She's, she's an old friend. How about um, Angela Lansbury? Well, I worked with Angela on a couple of Murder, She Wrote episodes. That's right. She was great. She was very good with actors, yes. Um, Ever Julie Andrews? No, no, I've never, uh, never, never worked or met Julie. I've worked with Dick Van Dyke a couple of times. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. huh? One yeah. of the the favorites. Yeah, one of our favorites. What about uh, switching off with some music a little bit? Have I get a chance to meet? Sh you don't hear her name as much, but one of the great voices, Shirley Bassey. Ah, uh, well, no, I think I'm, <laughs> in the, I think I'm on the wrong end of the business for that. That would be, I would be a fan if I did. That would be. Yeah. Uh, but you did mention Spielberg and on several yeah, occasions. Yeah, there we are. Let's catch me if you can. What, uh, tell us, what, what is it like working with him? Uh, you know, with, it's like, it's yeah. like staying after school with your favorite teacher, you know? Yeah. You don't, he doesn't have to be there. You don't have to be there. You want to be there. Mm -hmm. And he has this rare quality for a director. It's an important quality for an actor, but for a director to appear effortless. Yes. Gary Marshall had it as well. And Jordan has it. So maybe it's not that rare, but it's not rare in talented people. Stephen believes so much in the quality of his crew, in his instincts and the basics of storytelling that he really lets you, when he gives you the ball, he lets you, he lets you run with it, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's a very trusting, yeah, uh, easy, easy to get along with fella. And he's a great fan of film mm -hmm. and film history. Um, yeah. And and he, he told me a story on Catch Me because you know uh, the first day there um, we were introducing it was Chris Walken's first day. Here's Chris. Here's um, Valerie and Leonardo and Alex. Is Alex? Oh, there you are. I go. Hi, uh, Stephen. Can I just say something before we start? He goes, Sure. He goes, Junior, count to twenty in Greek. And he goes, No, what? In Alamosa? And I go, Yeah. And then immediately he goes, Alex was young Henry Jones in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Which, you know, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, you know, it's only that and the original Ben-Hur. It's one of the greatest adventure films of all time, right? And um, he said afterwards, right, right we, we rehearsed the scene, he stepped up and he, and he says to me, he said, Alex, I, you know, I, I forgot that that was you, but I just really liked your audition for Catch Me If You Can. And um, I said, that's all right, uh, Stephen. I, no, thank you. I, 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 you know, I like all your films too. And we got along so well that when they were casting Tintin mm. about five or six years later, there was one part left and a cast of 25 with Daniel Craig and, um, and uh, 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 Simon Pegg and all these wonderful uh, Jamie Bell as a stall holder in Covent Garden. So talk like this, you know, and he just cast me. So Alex, uh, Stephen wants you in his next film, my agent said. <laughs> And, you know, it's just great to have Steven Spielberg remember you and trust you. And he was validated. It's almost like I could see for him, he liked me twice. He liked me for Sean Connery, and then he liked me for um, Catch Me If You Can. It's a gift, absolute gift. It really is on many levels. You mentioned uh, Indiana Jones, Last Crusade, another phenomenal one. Tell us about this, how this came along too for you. I mean, everything we're listing here, this, this, these are iconic things. Well, you know, funnily you enough, know. Um, there was an agent named Marion Rosenberg who never represented me, but she knew me. She said to Mike Fenton, the famous casting director, that I'd be a good catch because they were looking for someone to play a young Sean Connery. And I had a good voice. And it turned out, you know, to be no screen time. I mean, it's the back of my head in my hand. But it was Stephen. And I remember my agents at the time, fancy ass agents, they said, oh, no, it's a day. You shouldn't do this. I go, OK. I don't even think those agents are alive anymore. And I'm talking about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So, <laughs> you know, do I have any memorabilia? Jen wants to know. I, you know, I do. I, I, I've collected you, lots you of do stuff. the comic cons and different do, things. Yeah, right? I've been doing do. that lately. Well, because yeah. fan, um, Fantastic Four is really what gets me into some of these shows. Geared towards when that. I'm there. You know, especially Marvel now that comics. I've written the book. Yeah. yeah. Yes, right, exactly. My favorite role, Merlin, I know you're wrapping up here. You had the picture of me as the fighter pilot um, with all that hair. Uh, oh, that, yes. That, that she was talking my favorite about that? role, yeah. funnily enough, to play, yeah, to play a uh, F-14 
pilot only because we have, the location was uh, the Bermuda Triangle on board the USS John F. Kennedy mm. sitting in the front seat of an F-14. It was just an extraordinary opportunity. And it was, it wasn't a great show. It was Super Carrier, it was called. It was a TV yeah, series, right on for TV. Exactly. But again, it, uh, that was it. And you know what? I still have that flight suit. And thankfully now, because of my tennis, I can yes. fit in it. I can fit in it again. <laughs> He's a tennis player like me, which is uh, really <laughs> fantastic. That's a great shot. Did you ever uh, get called from modeling? No, you know, I don't think I did. I'm surprised you didn't. Oh, you know? wow. Okay, well, it's still, um, you know. They got they got I mature mean, models and it's not over now in Fl Florida. I have an agent and I have an agent in Atlanta. And funnily enough, I think see? they're a modeling agency. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, mean, I got to um, I got to plug the book. Okay. What's I mean, it there you go. Look at that. I mean, that's called in the volume. Okay. Uh, my life in film and TV. And I the, love the poster behind you. And yeah. You have well, the book with you. you there, right? It was good artwork. Yeah, I have the book somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Let me get it. And there is his chair. Well, once again, we always get a chance to see the celebrity guest's chair. This is exclusive. This only happens on the Gym Master Show Live. <laughs> and for those, you know, It's amazing. They get the Oscar, the Emmy, the book. There we go. Let's do a full screen on that. This is, this is where my memorabilia lives, funnily enough, uh, Jen. You know, um, yes, I have props and I have, I've collected scripts. I recently moved from L.A. and, you know, I donated lots of it and uh, sold some of it as, at, at auction. But I have, you know, things like a, 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 the Viper pilot jacket from Galactica, the flight suits. I sold my Civil War um, memorabilia. I, I donated my Civil War costumes to a museum. And, you know, yeah, you, you, you collect things through the years. But as, as I'm sure you can all know, if you've moved more than more than once or twice and you're in your 50s, there's a great joy to actually getting rid of those darn boxes. So the 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 um, the payout of, of writing this book in the volume, which is a term from motion capture that I learned on Tintin, funnily enough, you're in the volume instead of being in the shot. It's a great way, I think, to encapsulate my life. Um, uh, like if it was politics, they say you're in the arena. And it's my life in film and TV. And because of IMDb, I could go through and say, oh, yeah, wait a minute. That's when I did that. That's when I did. So I sort of use that as a spine. But it's a lot more than that. There's a, the, a, lot, of, uh, a, a lot of sort of memories of uh, being on location and with Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman and Elaine May and Ishtar. And, and then that I made this film, the Hamlet movie, Three Days of Hamlet, a few years ago. That's uh, right was um, was uh, was an inspiration that sort of scratched the itch that I felt I'd missed uh, by not staying in England. I, 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 I just loved that character and I was able to play Hamlet. I was 50 years old at the time, but Olivier was famous to say that in order to play Hamlet when you're 50, you need to play Romeo when you're 20 and Henry V when you're 30. And I played Romeo when I was 20 years old. Uh, and so... Um, I, I, I felt uh, it was a joy to uh, to create. And this is a documentary, really, of of it's sort of like Big Brother meets meets Roadshow RSC. It takes place both on screen and off screen. And rather like a film years ago by Pacino called Looking for Richard, which was an examination, really, of Al Pacino's quest to be Richard III. Of course, he had John Gielgud. Kenneth Branagh in it. I had Richard Chamberlain and Stephanie Powers, so not bad for a little uh, independent movie we made 10 years ago. It's around. If anybody wants so they can get it, right? any it's more of me, yeah. first of all, thank you. Yeah. Um, in, in the volume, Three Days of Hamlet, I'm easy to, I'm easy to reach, I'm sure. There's there the we go. Website right um, there. And happy, happy to. Books on uh, Amazon. Got a couple quick things that you sent along that I'd love to show. You also like to paint, huh? <laughs> well, now that, funnily enough, is from, it's a still from a film it is. called um, The Quest for Tom Sawyer's Gold. Oh, that's right. Yes. And I play, I play J.J. Um, Harper, who's like the great grandson of Joe Harper, who was along for the ride with Huck and Tom way back then. And the reason I wanted to show you that, or just that's out and released now, it was, a, it was made about a year and a half ago. That was supposed to be my dear old friend Val Kilmer. Mm. was who who 
Mm. One, the last thing he did was create a one-man show. Well, he's still alive, God bless him. Yeah. The last thing I saw was when he created this one-man show of Mark Twain. And mm. I was at the Past Indian Playhouse, saw it, and he was absolutely lovely. Wonderful actor. Wonderful, wonderful guy. It's just he became sort of too big. Yeah. Too quickly. Too quickly. Time and just sort of burn through. There's a wonderful yeah. line in Hamlet where they where, where where one of his friends says to him, your ambition is too narrow for your mind, which means you could do more if you believe in yourself. And with Val, it was almost the opposite, I think, you know, his mind was too narrow for his ambition. He um, he was so good that if he had had this sort of Steve McQueen or had this essence to him to really just relax and be as opposed to, I, you know, he must have he must have been driven by something. I, I saw that wonderful documentary that was the, um, the uh, Joy at Cannes a few years ago, talked a lot about his dad. And, um, you know, he was he was a wonderful guy. But anyway, that was supposed to be Val. That was supposed to be Val Kilmer. And he couldn't do it for health reasons. And um, my dear friend, um, Zeus Zamani is his name. Imagine working for a guy named Zeus. You know, if you work for a guy named Zeus, you, you know, you, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe you used to live on Mount Olympus for a while. Right. You know? <laughs> Cousin anyway. Tesoro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another great one here. Tell us about this. Oh, that's Oli. That's my friend yes. Oli Sasson, the director of, uh, of the original Fantastic Four. I just saw him a, a, a couple of days ago. I was in New Orleans for a couple of days. He's a wonderful guy. He's always putting projects together. He's a he's a Louisiana native. He was heavily involved in uh, putting film productions when Louisiana was at the forefront of its uh, 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 attracting uh, the film business. With the, you know, states occasionally go through periods of tax oh, breaks yeah. and whatnot. So that's why you saw a lot of shows set in Louisiana for yes, a few years. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I hope I hope to work with Oli again. That's the royal premiere of Biggles, uh, the lovely Peter Cushing Neil Dixon film, where. Um, the princess of Prince and Princess of Wales were uh, the benefactors of the Royal Air Force charity, which was naturally the uh, the, uh, the the charity tie into our royal premier. So you know when you've done something like that, and you're it's uh, that's a high. And that, of course, is um, there's Julia and a horse, and then I'm the guy with the number two. So Julia Roberts, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. that's a great, great. Gary shot. said, "You got time for one more?" Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, uh, they called me to the set, okay? I told you, they were under the gun to cast this romantic foil. And they called me, my, my agent, Barry Bogart, said, hey, Alex, remember that Newhart tape that uh, you dropped off at the studio at Disney about six weeks ago? And funnily enough, my mom had uh, dropped it off on her way back to Palm Springs. She was up visiting and the, she dropped it off. So ah, I'm on the Disney lot. Here's your tape. And I mean, they thought that was charming. I go, yeah, is it this and they want to see you um, tomorrow. And there's Wednesday there. Uh, it's for a film called 3000 starting Richard Gere and a newcomer named Julia Roberts. I go, oh, OK, great. And uh, uh, I said the part works Tuesday. My agent said, us, oh, my God, OK. So naturally, I was there, and they sent over the script, and it was wasn't much. It was, I mean, he's not too hard. I, I was okay, and I went. And um, Steve Ruther, the producer with Laura Ziskin, said, "How do you how do you like the script?" I go, "Hey, it was great. I read it all in one go." He goes, "Good. We worked on it a lot." And then I'm waiting for them to finish a scene. They're filming the movie, the stage eight at Disney or something. And then I, I'm waiting with Dory Zuckerman, and the casting director. In, these, in another little office that's dimly lit. It's probably going to be a future location. In walks Gary Marshall. Alex, I saw your tape. You were very funny. And I go, hey, thank you, Gary. B big fan. He goes, okay, let's do it. And um, then I start, you know, Vivian, David Morse. Hey, I like that hat. Come see my horse. Gary goes, okay, okay, good, good, good. I'm going to let you know. As soon as I can, um, would you dye your hair blonde? I got a lot of dark people in this movie. I go, yeah. He said, I hear you play polo. <laughs> and that was Dory Zuckerman, who knew I was pretty good on a horse and that I was a golfer. And I go, yeah, you know, I can swing the stick. It's good. I'll let you know as soon as I can. And of course, <laughs> the agent called up like two hours later. He says, oh, they loved you. And then here comes the thing that scares everybody. They want you to come in again tomorrow. <laughs> 
<laughs> Only this time it wasn't with the director on the on the on the, on set. It was with the casting director in a little room on a blank wall doing <laughs> Vivian. It's David Morse. I like your hat. And then, you know, it was fine. <laughs> and then uh, that was Friday. And the end of the day, it says, hey, I thought you said this part works Tuesday. And she goes, oh, it's next Tuesday. So them SOBs, they sat on it for a week. And finally they called and offered me the part. But my, my, that's the, uh, the thing that is just unbearable. It's sort of grueling yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Soul destroying is, you know, it's uh, so good. And then, ah, uh, and it's the, it's those personal foibles. It's those insecurities, mm -hmm. that the human yeah. nature. And I'm going to leave you with one thing that I learned through the years. There's a wonderful yeah. phrase that in order to suffer the joy in life, yeah. right. you have to suffer the sorrow. Yeah. Yes. So look at that word. Like that that the word in common is suffer. Not always a bad thing. If it's sorrow, yes, the sorrow is hard. But also suffer the joy. Don't overreact. Don't necessarily think that it's all you because you know in this business as an actor it's usually them it's them saying thank the lord we can now move on because he'll do just fine you know he'll do just fine and it exactly. comes down to would you dye your hair blonde <laughs> <laughs> you know, come on. And, a, and a good moisturizer yeah, as my colleague doug llewellyn from the people's court said just want to throw in this because very important you were in this too henry jones senior tell us about that, was, that. That's you know, that was the wonderful River Phoenix. Yeah. And he was such a joy. I was only with him two or three days. He was only yeah. 17 at the time. And I have a lovely story about this film yeah. in my book. Yeah. Um, and River was a very intuitive actor. He had the ability, I believe, to compartmentalize. You know, uh, in a metaphysical in a metaphysical sense, you know, the 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 closer you get to the center of something, the bigger it becomes, you know. And that's what made Travolta so good in the beginning. And River Phoenix was, I think, flat out the most enjoyable actor to watch and to work with because you never were quite sure what he was thinking, but you couldn't take your eyes off him. He was a wonderful, talented fella. And... Um, you know, it was just a, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was the first story I really wrote many, many years ago about the three days on Spielberg movies. And um, that was the impetus. And once I started writing those, and then the others sort of fell into place. But the experience of working with River and having the honor and experience and ability to, to, to speak about him in, in familiar terms is uh is is is, a, is is just a pleasure you know he was he was a, he was just he was sad that we lost him because i think he he would be one of the big american actors now you know he would have he was as good as johnny depp at any time johnny mm. depp when he was younger was wonderful you know absolutely um, right and even a young young leo so love pretty woman thank you kathleen is my book in audio format yes Yes. I, uh, I I put some good music in it. It's out there on Audible and whatnot in the volume, and I got to play all the parts. Yes. Who's this, who's this guy here? That's oh, that's the doctor in Dahmer. Yes. You know? Oh my gosh. Yes. They make shows. They make shows about Jeffrey Dahmer. Yes. And, and you, Michael Learn yeah, in it too, right? Oh, and then they say, yeah, and it was really good. I says, come on. I mean, how? Uh, this but, was you know, on Netflix. Uh, yeah. How did this come in your way? Michael Lerner from the Walterns in it, played the mother. Yeah, well. Uh, how did this happen for you? You know, they uh, they were casting. It was just, it was, was it um, coming out of the pandemic, I think? Yeah. They were just casting. And, you know, the reason why a lot of actors now are leaving Hollywood is because for years they've been remote casting. And the pandemic gave them no choice. I mean, there was no yeah. more offices, no more casting. Self directors. tape auditions. So and, this, and, and, and I love it. My wife Shelley is is good at um, at. Uh, she was an assistant director when we met on a little movie, and she uh, she doesn't have her head in the stars. She's great with talent, great with people, and she and I had a string of really good auditions uh, that summer. And uh, Dahmer and Nope were just a result of sending in 
tapes, self tapes, and you have no idea, at least when you're in a room being somebody's 1115, you know, there's four guys who look at, like you on the way in and there's another four who look like you on the way out. You know, come on, what are you doing? And uh, you never know. You never know in, in, in remote casting. And, um, you know, uh, and, 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 the, and, and these, this day and age when they're casting a period piece, yeah. there's 1959 as a doctor, you know, I have a chance. Are you a New York Mets fan? Yes, I am, funnily enough. Yes. I went I, to a Mets I game. I did my research. I grew yeah. up on Long Island, and we, yeah. my father, a longtime Brooklyn Dodgers fan. So, yeah. when, of course, the progression was when the Dodgers abandoned New York, a, a good chunk of those fans went with the newly formed New York Mets. So, yeah. Politans. Yeah, I was at a Mets game on um, Memorial Day weekend. I was up there for a book signing, and my, my boy and I, Went, took a, what, took the seven train, I think it was, mm -hmm. all the way. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Beautiful stadium, wonderful stadium. Oh, City Field, yes. Yeah, yeah. Our, uh, she's actually a dear friend of mine. I, I knew Gary Carter quite well. I played on the um, Celebrity Players Tour, oh, which did. golf tour in the late 90s to about two, 2005. And Gary was one of the uh, athletes on the tour. I got, yeah, got to know him very well. He was a lovely guy. Kathleen Walker lives in Queens, New York, and she does work with uh, the New York Mets. Oh, so good. she's all excited. Yay, New York Mets. Yay. Hey, I, I still have all the yearbooks and the scorecards and the scorebooks from, you know, Felix Mion, Tom Seaver, of course, Greg Ned. I mean, just all these incredible people. Yeah, Dave uh, Wright kept the, uh, kept the team going for a few years. Yes, absolutely. Ed Cranepole. Remember those names? He's out on Long Island at Crane Pool. He's uh, still. When still I grew up in Palm Springs, uh, Gene Autry owned the Angels, and the Angel Stadium in Palm Springs was the spring training home of the California Angels up until probably the early '80s. I used to sell ice cream when I was a kid in the oh, uh, in the stands during spring training. Saw so players like Yastrzemski and uh, oh yeah, and uh, Boog Powell and uh, Frank and Brooks Robinson. Wonderful, wonderful players. If you didn't do what you're doing now, I mean, actor, producer, director narrator you have punch audio which is terrific um what would the other thing have been would there have been another thing would you have gone in a different direction would you have gone into athletics or something else you know uh, funnily enough i think I, I wouldn't mind going into city government of sorts not necessarily as a as a mayor or a um, or a um, city council member but like a city manager something like that which is a producer you know taking assets and and being responsible for them in a smaller town. I mean, like Palm Springs, where I grew up, or smaller town. And, and I talked to my son, who's a recent Auburn graduate. He's 22 now. And, you know, I think that that kind of service to community is can be very rewarding. Um, uh, you know, you have to kind of put up with politics of it for a while, but I think you have to put up with politics in any field that you want to succeed in. You have to put up with those who those who are already doing it and those who want to do it. So, yeah, it might have been city. I wouldn't mind being involved in, in civic, you know, civic, city government. What are some of those you just mentioned, uh, your son? What are some of the other blessings and joys in your life that keep you moving forward in what is a very uh, unpredictable and, and crazy industry, but a fabulous industry as well? What are some of those things that you call upon to uh, ignite the fire, reignite the fire, and keep you going, Alex? Well, you know, every day is a blessing. Every day yeah. brings with it moments that can remind you of how fortunate one is. It can also remind you of what has yet to be done, and you try to prioritize. I don't really have, I mean, I'm, uh, I have faith in, in good choices. I have faith in common sense. I don't really rely on... Uh, too many mechanisms. But I'll tell you, Jim, in the year and a half that I've been living here in Pensacola, which is not Southern California, not Santa Monica, as lovely as Santa Monica is. And not Miami I, either. No, I kind of felt that I'm finished chasing fame in a way, you know. I've chased it my whole life and occasionally catch up with it, occasionally have nibbles of it. Catch me if you can. Catch, you know, I've caught it a couple of times and it's caught me unprepared, perhaps. Now I'm not, I'm going to let it, I'm going to let it catch me again. And there is a, um, I, uh, there is a uh, 
satisfaction, I think, to living in a place where I don't have to achieve as much in order to break even or, accor or uh, 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 yeah. uh, according to still be the envy of, uh, of, of others. And, you know, actors are a tribe. People who work in show business are a tribe. And look at this dreadful summer of labor unrest and how angry people were. They're a writer on a TV show. They're an actor on a TV show. But everyone was angry. Mm. They wouldn't let actors promote films. You wouldn't, you couldn't let Tom Cruise promote Mission Impossible 3 because he was on strike. What? I, these are the kind of movies that keep you alive. What are you talking about? So, or something we did 30 years ago. You know, yeah, yeah it, it, we think that the answer to our problems is more rules or more supervision or permission. And, you know, show business has always been like that. You're, you're, at, you're up to, you're, you're dependent upon other people's whims of which you have no knowledge whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. Their personalities. Sometimes their moods. they want you to come in and act like you know everything. Sometimes they want you to come in and, you know, the most dangerous thing to be asked in an audition is, do you have any questions? You better say, no, I just, <laughs> no, I'm good. You. This is great. Yeah. You know, yeah, we're good. So I think that, you know, I'll what, Google it tonight when I go home. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what gives me pleasure these days is that I feel I don't have to, uh, I don't know what Tom Petty said. Sometimes you work so hard, nothing ever really seemed to come from it, you know? Yeah. Right. And the other one that my wife loves is most things I worry about never happen anyway. You know? Smart lady, because I'm going to be, so I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be one of the, I'm going to be on the Tom Petty radio. I'm going to be, they asked me to be one of the last DJs. They do a half hour. That is show. cool. And, and you're coming to Tribeca in New York too in October. Well, the 29th. I might, I might be. I was back there in wow. Memorial Day. It's, it's, it, 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 uh, it, it coincides with the Miami Book Fair, and I think we're, we're Punch Audio is launching a uh, an authors independent uh, program down there. So I might have to skip Tribeca this time, but I'll be back next spring. That's fantastic. Do you get up to the north at all, or do oh, you I love New York City. Yeah, and my like, yeah. my son loves it. It's just yeah. uh, right now. I was looking at hotel rooms at like five six hundred dollars a night. He says no thanks. When it's, we were uh, Memorial Day, it was only a couple hundred. Yeah. But you know, my little uh, secret is stay over in Newark. Audible's headquartered is right there. You can stay there, and you take Penn Station at Newark to Penn Station in New York City. It's half an hour, and it's and five dollars. And, and the hotel rooms are you know one hundred fifty bucks. So. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Now they'll go up. See, now Newark's going to be sold out. <laughs> yeah. Alex Hyde White's tip. Go stay in Newark. <laughs> That's it. Tell them Punch sent you. Yeah. Tell them Punch in, sent you. In Newark, right? Yeah. And don't, don't carry any cash. <laughs> That's it. Congratulations on the book. Um, when you wrote the book, do you have it? Is it? Is there a specific reader in mind or would anybody get a kick out of it? Well, you know, I think... Sir, uh, I've used the term loosely, celebrity biographies are for people who, who I suppose like celebrity. A lot of people like biographies. Some people think celebrity is a, is a, a word that, you know, uh, has connotations of, of, of nothingness or, uh, so I think, you know, I'm an actor, uh, but I'm a, I'm a person, I'm a very observant fellow and I, I made whatever living I've been able to make. It's because of, of my joy in observing. Not so much the joy in performing, but the joy in observing. And I've learned so much in attention to detail. And, you know, if you are a fan of, of, of film and that sort of that, that 70s, that 80s and 90s up to modern day independent films, I've, I've, that's my progression. In the volume to me means I'm in it in a way that I've always been, but it's the business that keeps evolving. And... I've been able to remain consistent in it. And I, you know, it's a travel piece, really. It's a time travel through 80s and 90s pop culture represented with, with some wonderful films and TV shows. But there's always this, you know, if I was a mountain climber and I was called the Seven Summits, then yeah, I'd, I'd say the, the seven high peaks, but it'd also be the stories of when I crashed, and when I couldn't do it, when I couldn't afford to do it. So, you know, it's a good example, I think, of 
uh, it's an honest telling of my life. And sometimes mm -hmm. in celebrity bios, you really don't get that. But that's the difference, you see. In L.A., you kind of have to always pretend. Right. And here I'm in Pensacola, Florida. You they already them. like me here. I'm all there. right. <laughs> Thank they you like to all me. your friends, to, Kat, to, to Kathleen and Anne. And, all uh, of the JMS, uh, the Lovities and that so much gets, more. I'm a Lovity, they said. Thank you. You are. Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. And... Uh, Thank you for all the years of entertainment and joy you've brought and uh, making us think with the characters and making us laugh. And I think you meant this show, this year of entertainment. It's been a long the time. Thank year you, thank of you for entertainment. Me. Oh, no, the pleasure. What I do is I tell people they're conversations and you have every opportunity to uh, stick with it and express for as long as you want. We don't do a wham, bam, five minute, 10 minutes. Tell us about the book and out. If you only have 20 minutes, that's what we do. But I think what's really great is people got a, a fuller, deeper understanding of somebody that uh, they admire and somebody that uh, has been doing it a long time. And it's also very inspiring for others who might want to take a crack at it. And just in reading your book, there's little nuggets, I'm sure. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the log line that the publisher put in, it's a sort of a cautionary tale of, right. of triumph, triumph and tragedy uh, exactly. highlighted with some memorable, I mean, this wouldn't have been an hour and a half if it wasn't for Fantastic Four or Pretty Woman or Spielberg or, you know, you name it. We didn't even get to, to Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman. So maybe we'll do that next time. I mean, I have been around wonderful, talented people, sometimes at their best, sometimes not. And uh, it all it all is worth remembering. And in, in this instance, it was a joy for me to tell. And on occasion that someone reads it or listens to it, please leave me a review on Amazon. I want to know that, yes. I, that I've made a difference even in a small way because I cannot compete with, um, yeah. you know, with, um, with the high profile, uh, yes. uh, 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 uh. the names out there. I cannot, nor, nor would I expect to. But I do think that as an actor telling his tales of Hollywood, that my book stacks up with anyone's. Um, yeah because it's been so diverse, you see. Matthew Perry with uh, Friends, for instance, it's terrific. But that's yes. Matthew Perry from Friends. I'm not Alex Hyde White from Biggles. I'm not Alex Hyde White from Fantastic Four. You might not even know those, but when you read, maybe you read Alex yeah. Hyde White's book and you might say, wow. The body of work. Is, this, this guy is a, is a human being. Right. You know, it's, almost, it's like Forrest Gump in a way, or right. You know, I've been history to, I've been, been witness to, a lot of film history that a lot of fans remember a lot of when you're an audience member, you are yeah. a witness. You are a witness. What you see, you go to see Oppenheimer. You're now a witness. Yes. To that story. And it's an excellent story. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and so yeah. I like, I, I, I hope that my audience, whoever uh, comes across stumbles upon this by mistake, you know, help me spread the word because, um, well, I want to, I want to hear about it. Well, it's kind of, it's very similar to what I always say. And people have said who watch and guests who've been on sort of bringing back the large start of conversation in a style with what I'm doing here, playing off my television radio background, kind of like some of the names that you've mentioned, like a Merv Griffin, or even a Dick Cavett, Carson, uh, not rushed conversational. And like you said, people with the book and even in this conversation on our show, Alex, have a deeper appreciation for the art, the work, the man, what it's all about, the ups, the downs. And I think uh, that's why I love the conversational style. Interview, yes. No, you're wonderful at it. I mean, uh, you, you deserve continued success because, um, you know, I've, I've done a few of these in the last year and a half and the book's been out. And, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's like we're at Musso and Frank's having a dinner. You know? Exactly right. Or at That's... Sardis in New York. You know? Yes, yeah. with some folks listening in and enjoying the conversation. <laughs> That's, That's why we speak loud. <laughs> my dad, my uh, English-Irish dad, as I mentioned, uh, from New York uh, City originally, told me, and I mentioned this uh, sometimes on the show, uh, when I was about seven or eight, you know how sometimes dad can give you some of this adult-like advice, which is about how to get through life and things you deal with in life. He said, Jim actually Jimmy, because he's always used Jim. Hey, Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, whenever anybody says something kind, no, I'm seven years old. Whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you, make sure you thank them 
and then ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I learned something similar from my, my, my year in Washington. And they, they would say, if you have nothing nice to say about someone, you come and sit right next to me. You come right here. <laughs> What do I what my thought? Jen needs to know my thoughts of drive-ins. I, I grew up in Palm Springs when they had two wonderful drive-ins. I saw some wonderful films there. I think as long as they show good movies, then then and you go there to watch the movie, that's fine. And if yeah. they don't, then it's a drive-in. You can uh, go back to the snack bar, or you know, you or but you need a station wagon, I think, and you you need to turn it backwards and put the put the tail down. That's the way to to watch. That's a it. If you. Know, if you joined us late, uh, folks watching around the world, because we realize we have viewers watching in all different time zones, this entire conversation and episode of the Gym Masters Show Live series will be archived on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, so you can watch and enjoy the amazing conversation and our extraordinary guest, Alex Hyde White, joining us here from Pensacola, Florida. Uh, this was a joy and true delight and an honor, Alex. I really appreciate all the time. Uh, your wit and wisdom, the conversation. It was extraordinary. Our viewers liking it live and they'll like it in the archives. And we're going to, as I always say, keep the porch light on for you. You're welcome back anytime. And I hope you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely have with you. Well, good. And I want to hear more about uh, Jen Barry's 1981 VW pop-up. All right. Next time <laughs> you're in uh, the Florida panhandle. She's in Pennsylvania, Allentown. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> I'm surprised she hasn't, asked, she hasn't asked you, right? Yeah. <laughs> she hasn't asked you yet. Usually she'll ask uh, if the guest if they prefer the mountains or the ocean, because I'm an ocean guy, grew yeah. up, you know, Long Island, swim, yeah. surf, boogie board. Uh, she's a mountain person being yeah. in Pennsylvania. How about you? January. She I love the Sundance Film Festival. I, I have a timeshare of those two weeks. And so I try to go to Park City every January and, uh, and and I love it. I grew up in Palm Springs, which is a desert framed by mountains. So it's uh, the majesty of it all. But I think I've my mountain climbing um, uh, uh, days have really been uh, my Hollywood career, the ups and downs. So I uh, I guess I, you know visually I'm a mountain person, yes. But uh, the extremes are um, are what's interesting in you know, the heat in the summer and the cold yeah. in the winter. It's yeah. Just, yeah. 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 Kind of like the snowbirds six in the Northeast and six in Florida. Yeah. Not many <laughs> mountains in Pensacola. No, <laughs> my friend, this was really, again, an extraordinary delight and uh, truly I uh, hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you joined the time with me as much as I have with you. It was, thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. And thanks to your fans. And, uh, yeah, uh, let's let's do this again. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be an hour and a half. I can give you a shorter version, but it's been a great joy. Continued success to you, Jim, and uh, consider consider punch that you have a that you have a friend in Pensacola. I appreciate that, sir. You be well, and we will chat again soon. All right. Take care, Jimmy. Take care, Punch. <laughs> Iconic. A real gentleman, affable, funny, witty. And what a great, you talk about tennis. That was a great tennis match back and forth, just really enjoying one another's company and the conversation. And you got a chance to learn something about and a lot about this uh, iconic, legendary actor who has touched uh, so many lives through so many different performances on so many different uh, mediums uh, from film and television, stage and more. And uh, yeah, if you've always wondered about some of the other things that he's done in his career, you know, there are other, like Dustin Hoffman, Warren Beatty, some other things that we didn't touch upon, uh, but we really did touch upon a lot of incredible things. And we appreciate all of you commenting during the course of the show live. We also encourage you to, uh, if you love what we're doing here at the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series here, where we are approaching almost a thousand episodes, give the episode a like. Click the like button, uh, the thumbs up on our YouTube channel, and uh, also don't forget to leave a comment on the YouTube channel. Even if you commented in Lovety Hall, really do leave a comment in the comment section on our channel. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is... Gym Masters TV. The show is the Gym Masters Show. 
and the channel is Gym Masters TV. Thanks to all who have subscribed, who comment, who support, who like, who share, and celebrate in what we're doing here at the Gym Master Show Life Series. So many more great guests coming up, so many good times with all of you coming up. And truly, thanks so very much for being with us as often as you are. We all lead busy lives, and uh, I realize maybe you can't be here every night. Some of you are here every day, morning, noon, and night. Uh, whatever time we do our broadcasts, we tend to do it Eastern time. We are in the Eastern time zone here in the New York area in the United States. So we tend to do it in the early evening. But sometimes we've done afternoon episodes. We've done two shows a day, all kinds of stuff. When you subscribe to the YouTube channel, be sure and click the notification bell. That way there you'll be alerted uh, about all the episodes, you know, who's coming up and when we're airing it, if you want to be a part of it live. But don't forget, we archive everything right here at the Gym Master Show Live series. And uh, you can check it out again. You can watch it again. You can share the links and all the rest. We thank our wonderful guest, Alex Hyde-White, extraordinary legendary actor, producer, director, narrator, Punch Audio is his company, too, where he does all kinds of audiobooks, which is a fabulous area. I've had an opportunity to do audiobook work, and it's extraordinary. I want to let you know, too, that tomorrow we've got a special show coming up. Hope you'll join us. Beloved and world-renowned psychic medium, Barbara Bandel is going to be here at a special time, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. That's tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern. 10 a.m. Pacific. That's for those who are watching live right now. A little programming note. Join us. She is incredible. and She shares her most memorable psychic readings and personal stories in her new book. And she's going to be with us tomorrow live at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. A nice afternoon show for you. So uh, check that out live. And I want to let you know, too, we've had some amazing guests who have stopped by JMS recently. Well, ever since we started, but uh, we just had Chris Costello on, the daughter of Lou Costello from Evan Costello. She was just on with Nick Santa Maria, the brilliant actor and comedian, and also Donnie Most from, you know, we talked about Gary Marshall. Gary Marshall, of course, produced Happy Days, Laverne and Shirley. Well, Donnie Most, he made a return visit to the Gym Masters show with some exciting news. He's dropping new music and uh, he's got concert performances. And he was with us just a few days ago and so many more extraordinary guests from all different backgrounds. If you really enjoy what we're doing, don't keep it a secret. Let us know. Drop us a line. Send us a note. Leave a comment on the YouTube channel and tell other people. Tell your friends, your family, colleagues. Uh, when you're speaking to somebody in the supermarket line, just say, hey, have you heard of the Gym Masters show live? check it out. <laughs> we would love that. Word of mouth is still the best. Good stuff, gang. All right, we're going to wrap up. We thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Kathleen. Don't forget, everybody, you can do Super Chat, Super Emoji, Super Stickers in the Lovety Hall chat room when the shows are live. But at any time, you can support us with the heart icon, the little thanks heart icon that's under all the episodes. We love you all. We really appreciate you being with us, gang, from all around the world, all different time zones and uh, checking us out. If this was your first time watching the Gym Master Show Live series, we welcome you and we hope you'll come see us again. It would be a real pleasure to have you back with us again, gang. It's always a hoot to have you here. So for all of us, be well, take care, love one another. Don't forget to love yourself and uh, be good to one another. And come see us again right here on the Gym Master Show and Lovety Hall. We'll see you on the next one. I'm Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time. And cheers. <laughs>